um, oh, thank you. Uh, what shared leadership look like at your organization? Um, and why don't we just go in that same order with Lauren? Sure. Uh, well, to start, I am a member of the inaugural group or cohort of the Artist Circle at California Shakespeare Theater, which is located in Arinda. And basically what Cal Shakes did was think about during the pandemic, it started with a conversation of universal income. And there was a question of how to support freelance artists and how to diversify and become more inclusive in terms of the curatorial voice in which a theater or an organization is able to think about what they are programming, how they're thinking about institutional decision-making and how they can be more entrenched and supportive of the community, specifically the local artists that are surrounding the organization. And in talks um, with artistic leadership, Eric Ting, who's the artistic director, as well as the many folks who are on staff there, there was a thought about who are, and these are Eric's words, who are the artists who inspired Cal Shakes through the relationships they had had with them previously and felt like leaders in their community. And so there was an invitation to five artists. Um, I'll just name them because it's a very good, important cohort of people who inspire me. Um, Shannon Davis, um, his director and actor, as well as a community leader. Uh, Sarita Ocon, who is also an actor and activist and community cultivator. Mia Mingus, who works with the Transformative Justice Collective. Um, and Tatiana Chatterjee, who is also a community worker and who works a lot with incarcerated folks around art making um, and uh, abolition. And so basically what we do is as a cohort, we were offered this invitation to come and be a part of Cal Shakes to bring what we had to the table and to also take advantage of the resources that they have and what they could offer us in terms of a fellowship, grant making, institutional support, but without an ask for any sort of deliverable, which is really rare as a freelance artist. Um, and so from that, it became invitational monthly meetings, which we could attend if we so chose, but did not have to. And then an invitation into all facets of the institutional decision making. We're invited to all of the meetings. There's a um, great level of transparency. We can bring projects to them and ask for support around resources, whether they be financial or otherwise. And there are a lot of endeavors that each um, person can bring and, and also invite other members of the cohort to be a part of. So just speaking for myself, I regularly attend the protestorial meetings. I have been involved in talking about how to redesign the casting process to be something that um, encourages leadership from individual artists and relationship making, even if artists are not ultimately cast in a specific production. And uh, my fellow uh, members, Shannon and Sarita, are currently working on um, potentially Monday night one-offs that they could produce. Um, so there's a, a really huge sense of invitation and in that we are able to make it our own. And the last thing I will say on that, just to give the overview, is that the, the dream that we've been talking about is that this was in some ways a lab to think about how we can transform the Bay Area community in terms of, I don't even wanna say supporting freelance artists. I want to say recognizing the leadership that freelance artists are already bringing to the Bay Area because that already exists, whether or not you have positional power in a traditional sense. So thinking about how this can expand, Cal Shakes I know is looking to add more artists in the next phase. And then also thinking about how other theaters can now be invited to take that on as well. And what would it mean if in four years, every theater was sponsoring five to 10 artists. A really important part of this program I should mention is that we receive a monthly stipend of $500, which is not universal income that supports your, your whole life, but is really goes a long way as an artist to think about, you know, that that is coming in and that you don't have to offer anything except um, yourself for that payment. So um, that is a little snapshot of what we're up to. I think you're muted, Tanya. We're having mute issues. <laughs> Sorry about that. It uh, sometimes it's telling some of us 
um, just to be transparent about our technical issues that we're, I'll click unmute and then it says the host is not allowing me to be unmuted. So not sure what's happening there, but um, we will get through that. Um, but yes, thank you for sharing that. That's quite a lot that that's coming out of that. Um, uh, Ever, uh, I know that it's also very new, the idea of shared leadership happening uh, for your organization. I, won I wonder if you wanna talk about sort of since it's so new, like maybe what the dream of the, the shared leadership structure is that you're working with at Oregon Shake. Of course. Um, so yeah, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, you know, we're one of the big ones out there. So this sort of feels like both a big statement by Nataki Garrett, our artistic director, although she's been here for two and a half years, given the pandemic, I think we can still say new uh, artistic director. Um, I joined with her basically about a month after her appointment, mm. a few months after her appointment as the, I guess, original associate artistic director. And when uh, there was conversations with regards to how we wanted to organize um, our artistic office and the artistic leadership team, um, Nataki had a real um, sort of push towards creating a non-hierarchical three associate artistic director model um, and non-hierarchical being the real, uh, I think, important part of it. And again, this is very much um, in process. We each have our own purview. I'm associate artistic director, director of artistic programming, long fancy title to me, and I'm in charge of the in-person repertory producing and community productions, uh, May and Tio. Um, is our new associate artistic director and director of new work, who would be, who is of course in uh, involved mainly in a new work development, but also will be coming up with and producing a lot of new work programming like festivals, and that might be digital or in person, of course, and God knows what else. Uh, there are a million amazing ideas that they have that I'm excited to explore, and then Scarlett Kim. Um, who's been here, I guess he, uh, she joined us the second uh, second in the trio, um, uh, Associate Artistic Director and Director of Innovation and Strategy, and her purview is uh, digital and immersive technologies because that's a huge part of OSF's new sort of artistic vision. Um, although we have each of our purviews, um, why we were all selected, I think, is because we tend we are all artists. We are all directors, writers, creators, dramaturgs in our own right. Um, but also because we carry a lot of slashes in our interests. So none of us are sort of squarely sitting in our purview. We are interested in and have sort of um, a lot of work history experience and interest in the other people's purview so that it will actually be a real uh, collaborative endeavor. We're very new. Mayan joined us only a couple of months ago. So we're you know, we have our first artistic leadership retreat in a week. So I'm super excited about sort of um, diving into some of, how both the, some of how that collaboration is gonna work, but it's already been, because each of us have been selected for this specific purpose by Nataki and we're all coming in with a real buy-in support and sort of um, real belief in Nataki's sort of expansive, really ambitious vision for this organization and as such American theater, um, I think it's been quite easy to find our way together. Uh, what I'm really excited about, which we haven't figured out yet is, um, you know, the purview that I have, it has 87 years of history in the organization. Uh, New Works has about 10, 12 years of real history in the organization and uh, Scarless Digital Programming is a year and a half. Um, and so there is sort of uh, varying degrees of expertise within the organization, within our constituents in terms of our audiences, donors, supporters, uh, volunteers around our work. And budgetarily, of course, you know, like our, although we are not, uh, we're not hierarchical in our relationship, our budget sizes are very different by multiples. Um, and that's going to shift as we continue to build various different parts of the organization. But it's been a real interesting and lovely exercise to pull each other into each other's business, both artistically, collaboratively, but also financially in terms of how we're purposefully programming uh, projects that sit in the middle of all three or in the middle of two purviews so that budgets can be shared 
across the silos that we're trying to break down. We're hiring second and third uh, sort of level folks, associate producers, artistic associates, festival director, um, who are actually purposefully sitting in between those silos. They're actually reporting to two associate artistic directors so that we are very much building into our process the breaking down of those really hard lines because at least this is true for OSF even in my time, but certainly before, if the silos exist, there is always a hierarchy. So, and to be perfectly honest, the part of the organization that makes the most money, which currently and for a bit will continue to be the in-person programming, will always win. Um, and we're sort of, you know, if there is if there's an A or B, A will win, uh, just because of the sort of the reality of our uh, slightly, well, quite ca capitalistic way of producing in the regional American theater. Um, so we're sort of very aware of that and finding, trying to find ways to undercut some of that. The thing I should also name, which is really exciting for me is, this is the first time I'm actually sharing leadership or working with in a leadership way with two other immigrants. It's we're all three immigrants born and raised elsewhere, um, Korea, uh, Taiwan, um, oh, Singapore, oh my God, Korea, Singapore, Turkey. Um, so, um, it, it feels quite exciting uh, to be able to share that sort of global perspective as we're looking at each of our work. And especially Man and Scarlett, I will say, are coming from non-Western, non-American ways of leadership. Uh, they're really interested in breaking down some of that sort of very colonialist, very capitalist ways of thinking about how we put value on our work. And I'm really like, in a lot of ways, in a learning kind of space of how that can be put into practice in as large a um, an organization as OSF, because it is certainly uh, not uh, it is not easy, and it is very easy for all of us and the rest of the organization to sort of default back to uh, business as usual, which is something we're finding certainly as we come back from the pandemic. Um, so that's sort of where we are. Which, as I said, I don't have great wisdom yet, but great hopes, I guess. Those are amazing great hopes. <laughs> I'm very um, inspired to hear about all of that there. Um, I wonder, Morgan, I know that um, at Wilma, it's, uh, I was hoping you could talk about the rotating leadership in that structure and maybe tell us a little bit about it. Yes. Um, so I'm one of three co-artistic directors uh, currently at the Wilma Theater in Philadelphia. Um, prior to the three of us, there were four of us, including Blanca Ziska, who's one of the founding artistic directors, and she's been the artistic director for something like 40 years. So she invited uh, myself, uh, James Imes, and Yuri Ernov. the three of us are all directors, um, to come, and it's a bit of an experiment. It, it's a, like a four-year experiment. That's what we have the budget for. Uh, and the structure is that we are co-artistic directors, but um, each year there's a lead artistic director and there's someone who's kind of the runner up supporting artistic director. And then there's sort of a backseater part-time person and it rotates. Uh, so right now, uh, James Imes is the lead artistic director in the current season. And we're moving into the season where I will be the lead artistic director. And so I'm supporting him and I'm planning the next season. I, I'm curating collaboratively. So all the decisions I will make about next season will be made with my cohort. Uh, we meet once a week um, and we talk about everything. And we're also in the process through retreats and whatnot of figuring out what happens next. Because this this rotating structure was sort of like the the way that the organization transitioned from one artistic director to four and now to three, um, and so we're sort of at the end of my season, which is next year. We'll sort of re well at that point we will have a plan for how to go forward. So I'm kind of I'm at the moment we're in the middle of an experiment. And we're we're like figuring out what is great about it and what is challenging about it for how how to move forward in in a shared leadership model. 
I love hearing how everyone here is sort of in an experiment. That's um, God, thank you for that. Um, David, uh, I wonder if you can talk about the movement company. And uh, my understanding is that from the very beginning, there was a choice to have a, a producing artistic leadership team as opposed to one individual. Is that correct? Or? No, actually. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's hear about uh, it. <laughs> yeah. So we, um, we were founded in 2007, um, a group of NYU students. I, I was not a part of the initial founding, but there was a group of actors, writers, directors who came together. And we always sort of joke now that the original sin was uh, forming a company that like nobody really wanted, nobody really wanted to form a company, but at that moment in time, it's sort of the, um, narrative that was fed to us in school of like, this is what you must do. You must form a company, you know, if you want to make work. Um, but really, I think the impetus was a group of artists of color who were wanting to continue to make work together outside of school and who wanted to create opportunities for other artists um, where there were few sort of inroads into a lot of the major theaters or even um, uh, major uh, uh, culturally specific theaters in that moment in time. So uh, a, a theater company was formed that had a very traditional hierarchy. You know, it was sort of like a, how do you form a theater company? Great, pick artistic director, check. Pick executive director, check, you know? Um, and so uh, folks sort of fell into these titles. And in that first year, I was invited to be the initial artistic director um, following Darren Taylor, who was one of our founders. And so for the first five years of the company, we kind of um, miserably trudged through these uh, titles that didn't really fit us. You know, um, our executive director like hated budgets and, you know, our marketing director was more interested in like art making and, and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, do you know? And, and so we, in, in those first five years, we were really sort of uh, bucking against the model that we placed on ourselves and in a lot of ways was put on top of us. And um, in those first five years, uh, we had some uh, leadership change. Um, in those first five years, we met Deidre Harrington, who started off as an intern um, on her first day at the job. She was promoted. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that's how we sort of roll. And uh, we were part of this Art New York program. Um, theaters leading change. And it was through a conversation with a consultant, Ann Dunning, that um, at the time it was um, myself, Eric Lockley, Deidre uh, Harrington, Taylor Reynolds, and Jonathan McCrory, who was still with us. Um, we were part of really sort of having this conversation that the model um, wasn't working for us. And Anne really helped us as we sort of talked about what our values were, how we really worked together, what we were excited about in the ways that we made theater, um, this title came up. You know, we were all producers, we were all artists, we were all leaders, and we were a team. And so uh, five years in, we sort of scrapped this traditional hierarchical model um, and, and became a producing artistic leadership team. Um, and so at that point, we all took on the same title uh, and um, you know, there's a, a shared responsibility amongst all of us. We're able to like obviously lean into our strengths um, and uh, uh, support each other. Uh, it, you know, we, none of us knew really what it meant to run a company. So we were really sort of uh, teaching each other the things that we individually know and sort of bringing them together. Um, Taylor Reynolds uh, uh, was there and she was our associate we didn't know we were like you're an associate so for a year and then we were like it was like dating we're like do you want to like date us um and then um uh jonathan left to go run uh the national black theater and then uh in the last couple of years we brought on ryan dobrin who started again for a year as like an associate and we were like please stay um so now uh ryan is part of that team so there's five of us still who share the same title and divide responsibilities uh, amongst ourselves. And, um, you know, uh, Deidre has really sort of uh, uh, taken the lead on a lot of the sort of general management stuff uh, uh, and sort of managing director role, um, but none of that really falls solely on her. And I think that's one of the ways in which our model is that no one person 
um, has all of the information about anything. So at any point, if someone was sick, if someone got a job, if someone needed to leave, no one person is taking all of that institutional knowledge away. It's shared amongst us and we can really um, sort of ebb and flow and allow ourselves to be individual artists outside of the organization while also coming together and supporting the artists that we're bringing into the organization. And so we've been that for like the last 10 years. Um, but really, you know, we like to think of it as like a, a second founding of the company. There was the original founding and then the, the refounding where I think we really found ourselves. And, and in a lot of ways, I think liberated the anxieties that we were feeling about what it meant to run a company um, and, and found a system and a model that was actually working for us and, and, and in line with our personal and our artistic values. I love that. And uh, I love just the pure like non-acceptance of what the model, what you've been told the model is, just the like questioning, this isn't quite working. What is a different way to do it? Um, yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been a really interesting journey sort of figuring out how to, like we owned it very quickly, but then it's like you get paperwork and it's like, who's your artistic director? And it's like, uh, you have 10 characters, you know? And it's sort of like, how do you describe in so many, like, and I think that's the thing that we realized early on was it's not only the system that we inherited for ourselves originally, but it's the system that's at play in so many other systems that affect us. Funding, you know, grant applications, you know, how you're uh, uh, applying for your 501c3, like all of these sort of um, systems that are at play are designed to reinforce a sort of patriarchal hierarchy of a model. And I think early on, one of the things that we really got uh, uh, smart to and, 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 and got better at over time was how to talk about what our model was and how to push that forward, even when there wasn't necessarily space in the grant application. You know, we found, and we, we, we lost a lot of grants because we didn't fit the sort of box, you know, but then we've been able to sort of push it further. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that, both from you, David, but all the panelists, specifically about how you communicate shared leadership to sort of stakeholders more broadly. Um, but how do you talk about share what how do you describe how your organization works? Is it different for staff? Is it different for audience members? And what have what are people's reactions? I'll jump in. Um, for us, again, it's quite new, but um, one other thing that we should really name here is that it's three associate artistic directors, all immigrants, um, two women of color, one man of color, supporting a black woman at a major company. So there is a lot of already misunderstanding, undercutting, um, questioning of authority, expertise, and vision on a daily basis that each of us in our own ways, and I don't wanna equate my personal experience with any of those women, um, you know, that we experience. So when you are actually trying to change the narrative of how artistic vision, artistic leadership functions at an organization, um, and you wanna do it in a non-hierarchical way, in a slower, more thoughtful, um, sort of collaborative way, it's a real, um, it's actually kind of a real process. And we have to sort of, um, we've had thus far really great luck being very honest with each other about those challenges we're facing or when um, one of us really has to go in and speak, when we like supporting each other via chat, even if we're all in the meeting so that there is one voice, um, in what ways all three of us have to defer very publicly to Nataki. Um, and that's like the burden of being a black woman leader. Um, you know, th these are all sort of real questions we have and some expertise and wisdom from our years of living in these bodies and managing through the American theater. Uh, but it's been a really interesting process. I'm finding personally to speak to Kate, your question about the different constituents. Um, when I'm in spaces like this, when I'm talking to especially um, theater makers, 
um, it is very easily understood. They get it. There is no questions. There might be some like quick questions about history or process, but like people get it. Um, and especially if they all know in the case of our three selves, our credits and our sort of expertise is fairly even handed in a lot of ways in our various different purviews. So that's like never a question. Um, our audience is still figuring it out. I think I, what's so interesting is we're actually, as far as the audience is concerned, especially long-term audience, we're going back to a model because under Libby Apple, there were multiple associate artistic directors, although it was a very different group of people functioning and running it in a very different kind of way because it was only an in-person company at the time, of course. Um, so they're sort of trying to make sense of what we're doing in the context of history, which is helpful and unhelpful at the same time. Uh, what we're finding actually right now that we're working through um, uh, is like with staff and internal, even our own teams, really creating some clarity for people so that when the machine is as large as, o, as it is at OSF, um, there is a kind of a clarity of functional clarity of who's talking to whom about what and in what ways, who is the decision maker in what way, or when are the moments where it is a joint or collaborative decision making. There need, there, uh, I'm finding that we need, we are having to be a lot clearer before we're ready to be clear in some of those things. Um, and in a way, the, the, the change I want to see at OSF, and if this can actually go out into the field, is uh, I would be really happy about it and hearing sort of Morgan speak about uh, her appointment and her process as an experiment specifically is really helpful is, you know, we're in a place where a lot of us are doing things that's never been done before. So we actually don't know if it's going to work. We have no freaking clue how, how it's going to work. Um, that doesn't mean we're stupid. That doesn't mean we don't know what we're doing. There's literally no way to know what we're doing. Um, so there is, we have to get better, especially in the regional theater circuit, I would say, of this iterative progress where you're putting forth a really good idea, you're testing it out for a couple of years, it works, it doesn't work, you take the things that work, you leave the things that don't, and you move on. Um, and that is really hard for folks. And David, David, I'm so glad you mentioned the fundraising element to this because our foundational and government fundraising, especially, but even individual fundraising is so based on a narrative of this is exactly the right thing that's going to work perfectly. And here are everything that proves to you that it was the biggest success ever. And if it wasn't, you won't fund us again, rather than actually raising funds towards an experiment to learn something that can be useful to the field in the future. Um, there's some real change coming on the foundational side for this um, in small and big ways, but we have a ways to go. And in terms of these sort of big leadership experiments, you know, it costs a lot of money to have three of us um, versus one, you know? So those are, uh, there is a real need for, a, for the lack of a better word, some cushion around the experiment that's a very smart idea but we don't know if it's going to work um towards a sort of securing the experiment so that it's not just a short-term trial and error kind of process so those are sort of some things that comes up to for me kate out of, from your question can i add something Evren? because what you made me think of is that really the what i've noted you know sort of in the regional model is that there is such a um and this is so american that the whole one there's one way to do it and there's a stripping down of diversity that even when we think about leadership there's even even in the conversations that are happening currently which are on the forefront of new models there's still sometimes this energy around who's going to figure out what the right leadership new innovative leadership model is and then we can all get on board with that and figure it out and something that's been so beautiful about the artist circle at Cal Shakes and other models that are, you know, happening in the Bay Area and beyond, um, and and everyone who's here today is, I think it's so idiosyncratic to your community, what artists you're working with, what, what art you are invested in creating, and the vision that the specific unique group of people who have come together have, and that um, really for when we talk about constituency, what it means internally to rethink how do I relate to the idea of leadership and being a leader? And what does that mean to innovate around that with the specific group of people I'm with? And that, that experiment 
whether it succeeds or fails or whatever, and there's value in both, um, that experiment is important to this moment with these people and will look very different than OSF's moment, than from the movement's moment. And that's great because diversity actually helps the art, it elevates the art form. And also I think like all evolution ensures its survival. Whereas for the past 50 years, we've been kind of seeing this, everyone's trying to be in these straight lines that have been established a lot by funding and funders um, that has undermined really the, the impetus for the beginning of the regional theater project, which was an experiment to start with. And so what has, I think it's been the retraining for me and so many conversations of relearning and re-envisioning what leadership can be is remembering that experiment is leadership, that the to dare to fail is leadership um, and that and the humility around that. Um, and that's been something that um, I think at least in the artist circle has permeated our cohort, but has also influenced our relationship to staff as we're asking for things that they didn't necessarily think of when they started this program. Um, and then also audiences, how they relate to what does it mean? And, and artists, you know, when I talk about this program with other freelance artists, there's there's great excitement, but also so many questions of, well, I'm not a leader. Well, I don't have a title. Well, how, and, and the limiting way of thinking about leadership, especially within creative practice, uh, I think is something that it, it's very important for us in our myriad ways of expressing it to challenge and resist. Um, because I think that that's what's going to take American theater through its next century. Um, so I'm really excited to hear about all the initiatives and, and also remember that when we can start at the sort of microscopic, it can build out to a change in the culture, generally and nationally. I'm so struck by what you said, Lauren, of experiment is leadership. Um, and also everyone, what you were saying about honesty being an important trait. Um, so I'm curious, perhaps starting with Morgan and then opening it up, what are the traits, what are the skills um, that you feel are necessary for shared leadership? Yeah, um, I, I wanna answer that question and then also say um, in answer to the previous question about sort of like how to sell the idea of shared leadership, because I think that was something that Blanca Ziska did very successfully. And so I think, um, so I'll, I'll do that first and then I'll answer your question. Um, so she, there was a long process of her talking to the board. And I think one of the things about this moment, this was before the pandemic, was that the woman was dependent on subscribers and the subscribers were just going down and down and down. And so it was like, okay, we got to do something different. There has to be some change. Um, and Blanca's vision for this shared leadership structure was about directors, bringing directors in who would work at the theater. Um, you know, she really believed in an artist led organization, um, but also that the three of us as directors could continue to work elsewhere, which is something she couldn't do when she was the only artistic director and how that sort of like, movement of ideas and work and experience would um, make what's happening at the Wilma even more exciting and valuable. Um, so that I think those are some of the arguments that she made to the board when she was fundraising to make this happen. And, and being inside of it, I do feel that sense of expansiveness that it's not just one vision and one compelling voice. It's, it's, it's many perspectives, many experiences, slightly different aesthetics or taste and uh, I, I think when you find something that um, more than one person gets excited about, it's like all the more juicy. And, and so it's a, it's a very natural checks and balances system to have more, like I, lo I love the number three, but I, I think just more than one, <laughs> it, feels, it feels real. I mean, five is good too. It feels, it feels really, um, the, the expansive, the like the, the ideas in the brain expand. Um, I think to answer your other question, uh, transparency, which is this buzzword right now. And I was, uh, and I think when I encountered it at first, I was like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. 
but it's hard work to actually be transparent. And I think the first time I learned it was directing, just directing um, a play and uh, realizing that this whole concept I had talked to my set designer about, I had never talked to my costume designer about, something like that. And then you realize how much you have to repeat yourself. But it's, it, you have to repeat yourself. You have to make sure that you're communicating um, and sharing and listening to the feedback. So this, this action of transparency, which really does feel like a muscle, um, and then the flip side of it is listening. And I love what you said about humility, Lauren. And um, that, that felt so true. Uh, sure. It's such an interesting thing because I, again, I'm coming from, you know, associate artistic directors as the shared leadership, right? So in a weird way, uh, Nataki, who's brilliant, uh, selected a tree of people that go together. And I mean that in terms of we have real shared values and beliefs and a real commitment to creating artist centric spaces which like if you think about it the regional american theater was founded to make space for artists to do make make art and we have completely forgotten that purposefully over the last 50 years and have been very audience centric in a weird way and i audience as defined very narrowly um <laughs> right um and not that it has to be a against b because i actually believe that if an organization is artist centric all the audiences will be much happier to be perfectly honest uh, because the work will be better. So we have sort of a commitment to the same ideas and the same values and the same sort of change we want to see in the world. But we are very different people in terms of how we present ourselves, how we lead processes, um, what our superpowers are. We have very different superpowers. Um, and it's been a really interesting process just to give one example, I am fast. I can make very quick decisions. I can push very complicated ideas and processes through resistance by sheer will, right? And calculation. I have an engineering background. So I'm sort of very sort of regimented in certain ways and can move fast, which is positive sometimes and too fast sometimes, right? And what Mayan and Scarlett have brought for my life and my leadership is a forced thoughtfulness and slowing down and actually paying attention to making space for a larger conversation that involves more people to be able to actually question some of my biases and givens and um, sort of things I prefer in the context of um, a larger group of people that we actually want to have feel empowered and have leadership at their own in their own ways right so that has been the greatest gift of this shared leadership model for me and i will allow them to slow me down because there's trust and respect between us and i think we haven't gotten here yet to be honest but like i can see the ways in which if there are things that happen where that trust is broken or there are ways in which where somebody missteps and overstates, over promises, undercuts, we will have to find ways to have that conversation in a really um, thoughtful and sort of, again, collaborative way so that it is surface, it's transparent, it is handled, and we have a way to move forward. Again, this hasn't really, you know, this is, again, my ideal world. When it happens, we'll deal with it. Um, but I do think a lot of our conversations right now are about the ways in which we support each other, right? And that is both in terms of, because I have been the longest with the organization, helping Scarlett and Mayan traverse this machine and giving them guidance in terms of personalities and key people that might not have the title, but actually make stuff happen for you. You know, those are kind of like secret things, keys that you need to have when you're working in an organization our size. And then they're able to actually provide great reflections, thought partnership in my decision making, which I've never had in this position and really very much elsewhere. 
to get that kind of, I don't know what to do here. Let's talk, have two people who are at your level who have similar kind of responsibility and have your back, being able to have that conversation just results in better decisions. Just like, I, I mean, I don't think that's pretty obvious, but it does. Um, and it actually, for me anyway, it has lowered some of the anxiety of the responsibility that I hold because I know that there are other people who've got my back. And the one person I should, you know, she's not named as associate artistic director, but our director of production, Alice Holden, who's been here the longest, which is about eight, nine years, um, she actually is the fourth artistic leadership member. And although her purview is production, part of the silo breaking is the ways in which artistic and production, which is very regimented in the regional theater system and are run and managed very differently, we're also, as a trio, plus Alice trying to sort of question some of those givens and figure out how the three of us appear in her spaces and how she can actually have a very, very central role in our conversations. So that that actually very fake division between production and artistic is just not centered because it is more efficient to work that way for sure. But I think it is that division actually is one of the things that has caused, in my mind, the most harm um, for artists from marginalized backgrounds in the American theater. So we're sort of, again, we have a long way to go, but I, I do actually think we have the right four people in these positions. We just have, we just need some time now. Yeah, I, I mean, I love, Evren, that you talked about like a shared set of values. I think that's like fundamentally so important when you're going into shared leadership and into any kind of collaboration. You know, it actually allows you to um, embrace all of the differences of styles as knowing that at the end of the day, like there's that, those core values are the same. And I think what you're talking about with time too, one of the things that we've learned is there's a great deal of patience that that is required. You know, things, it takes time conversations take time. And I think something else that we have really learned, especially as we were um, producing uh, 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 the tour of what to send up and starting to work with other companies is like being able to also set boundaries. Um, you know, um, and boundaries around time, especially, you know, you get a lot of emails that are like, hey, we need to know the answer to this now. And we were like, great, we will let you know in two days. Do you know what I mean? And it was like being reasonable with that, but acknowledging. And I think early on, like we we fought to try to meet people's expectations of a timeline that feels very rooted in white supremacy. And we were very deeply like pushed back against, you know, and at first we were like, and it was, we were, we were running ourselves ragged, you know? And I think in that sense, as you're saying, it's like buying yourself the time to have the conversations, to really lean into the benefits of shared leadership, as, as Morgan was saying, the expansiveness of ideas and perspectives, you know, and giving yourself that, that time and, and being patient that it does take more time, you know, and, and as you get more and more comfortable doing it, you know, that time gets faster, of course, as anything does, but I think patience most certainly <laughs> is a trait that is needed. <laughs> which I lack greatly. I should like just to <laughs> own that in myself. Patience is not a natural organic thing for me. So um, in a weird way, um, I'm very thankful for my partner associate artistic directors, patience with me as I like get really frustrated about why we have to talk about that thing. <laughs> you know, because I, I, as I said, like my superpower is getting shit done, which is, you know, very helpful, but also, you know, not the way this is gonna work. That's what, I mean, that's why I think that we, I, I just want to acknowledge why I think that that is, why these experiments are so powerful beyond just what it's going to be in terms of what art we make or what audiences we serve. Because I was thinking, I was going to say patience too, David, and I was thinking a lot about what it means when there's conflict or disagreement of opinion and how it only really, in my experience, has worked well or when we come to the table with a desire to understand, even if we don't agree. And that uh, that is so lacking in our country currently. 
and thinking about what it means in these experiments to be in a circle with people who have different styles and different visions and different, even if you agree on values, the biases and value, personal values you bring, you might be fitting into the new value and that's practice for you. And so what it means, you know, we talk about how the art we make is going to impact the world, our country, our culture, but we don't often talk about how the process of making that art is going to impact the culture, the world, et cetera. And so I, I find what has been of great value to me in terms of how we think of what do you need to bring to the table is how is me participating in this practice of desiring to understand or being patient, even if I'm not naturally patient or taking on a new value and really trying to see how that's gonna pan out without automatically saying no to it or it's different. How is that process going to then trickle out into the how I participate in the rest of the world or life or how we model for other folks. And I think we're creating these hopefully microcosms of different ways of being within the polis that then we can expand out and hopefully, you know, change the way we treat each other as a country. Um, and, and so that's been something on my mind in this past year with the artist circle coming up through the pandemic is that really the process is the art in some way right now and just sort of figuring out the how of how we make uh, and that, that hopefully that can make us be more expansive in how we think we're, we're supporting and propelling change um, within our audiences. Because because to your point, Evan, I think it does trickle down even if it's only energetic uh, and they receive it through the work, but also seeing you know how people treat each other. When you walk through a lobby of a theater, you, you can see an exchange between box office and an artistic director and see you know that says volumes about what is going on. So I, I, it gives me hope actually for, for how we're gonna move forward. On that note, hearing all of you talk about the work it takes to have these conversations and, and the time it takes, um, I'm curious about, it's kind of a pragmatic question, but what do you have a system and a weekly meeting or what is your process for checking in with your teams? And if there's a schedule around that, what's the frequency of it? Yeah, we meet uh, once a week, all of us, and then there's more um, sort of splintering off smaller groups. Um, and then we, back to the transparency thing, we started doing like a, a update after the, uh, each uh, Tuesday's meeting that goes out to the whole staff. So they'll see what we're talking about and what play we're reading and talking about, that kind of thing. Um, and then we have also a weekly full staff meeting where everybody's present. So I think in the Zoom universe, it's become this very, like, it, it has to be structured and scheduled that there's less of the water cooler talk, which like deeply saddens me, but hopefully we'll get back to it. Um, I mean, I was never actually there in this job when we were in person. I've, I've done the whole thing online, so. It's been very strange. Um, and then out, I think outside of the the formal structure, we have, you, you know, personal side conversations, texting and calling and that kind of thing. And that's where some of the best ideas come from, uh, the more sort of like casual side chatter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would say similar, you know, as an organization, we we meet um, once a, once a week on Mondays, uh, 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 our like regular meeting time. And, you know, we get a lot done, obviously, in those times, but the real checking in the real sort of brainstorming dream storming ideas are happening on the like texting threads. And, you know, I think similarly, we, we, you know, it's like a tech, it's like a, a production meeting, you know, like we'll, we'll sidebar on that. Do you know what I mean? And so like, there's a lot of additional meetings. So we have the one collective meeting and then over the week we sort of break up and, and sort of uh, uh, meet individually. And I think one of the things that we've adopted that I'm, what's really exciting is that, you know, no, 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 
no meeting can only have one of us, like sort of no sort of, uh, if someone's wanting to meet with us, it's always like, great, at least two of us have to be there. So that there's, we're, we're trying to really model and disrupt this idea. If they're like, great, I'd like to meet with your artistic director. We're like, great, here are three people who are gonna show up to this meeting, do you know? And they're like, oh, we only have space for one. We're like, awesome, we'll be two, do you know? Um, and I think really like always that, like we are coming with a plus one, and we are both going to speak and sort of disrupt those models there. And I think also not necessarily allow um, the same two people uh, uh, to do the same kinds of meetings. So it's constantly, I think, uh, uh, this revolving door of allowing us all to really, you know, because I think even in, in our shared model, people are like, right, but who like really runs it? Do you know? And I think that's the question that we always get. And it's like, no, truly, like at any point, like any combination of us are really managing and overseeing anything. And, you know, as Morgan was saying, it, it happens in those sort of individual meetings uh, uh, over the week, but we've got that once a week anchor. And then we take a, 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 a winter sort of, um, we call it a staycation because we don't leave New York. Um, and then uh, in the summer we do a, a, a retreat um, and 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 those are real times where I think it's really about um, uh, shared visioning and and really re re sort of checking in and reflecting on every year, you know, um, and sort of saying, okay, great, what did we learn? What can we evolve? What can we change? How can we keep changing things up? Uh, Morgan, I think what you said about like Zoom meetings are where you formally, you know, do work aspect of it is killing my soul as well um, at this moment. So uh, I am way meeting out um, in this moment and zoomed out in all honesty, but um, that's been our main way of um, sort of we have a sort of a two hour artistic leadership team meeting with Nataki. That's where many of the larger conversations about initiatives, projects, programs, um, you know, issues that need to be addressed, uh, whether it be artistic or not, really get um, handled. Um, we have what we're calling an Associate Artistic Director Troika meeting. Uh, that's an hour every week, um, although um, as things get really busy, you know, two weeks ago, we opened like an inter-global VR festival at the same week that we started previews for our very first big show indoors, which was, you know, uh, if I weren't responsible for the scheduling of it, I'd say it was a terrible idea to do those at the same time, but here we are. Um, so, you know, it's it's been in, inconsistent right now, our regular check-ins in terms of meetings. The dreams we have, I would say, is that that would be a very regular meeting and more structured, and then we would like to have as frequently as once a month, what we're calling sort of much longer, four hour, maybe on a weekend, um, sort of dream meetings, because what we've been all lacking, we're realizing is um, getting our heads out of what's coming, like what's happening this week, what's happening this month, and actually start together digging into questions of what is the OSF we want to be helping run in five years, <laughs> you know, um, those sort of like much bigger, less focused on deliverables, you know, or just have larger conversations about what are some artists that we all like that man loves that I need to start learning about vice versa, you know, those kind of like our actual jobs conversations are very much um, at the bottom of the to do list right now and we're hoping in 22 to start sort of lifting those up. Um, and then we are a Windows company to the chagrin of many of us. Um, so we use Windows Teams. Um, that's our chat function. Um, and, you know, we have a little uh, Troika uh, uh, chat channel, which has been actually sort of a lifesaver because it functions as like you're in a meeting and you just need to rant at someone as to what's happening in that meeting and just get positive reaffirmation <laughs> that you're not crazy um, versus also like really, we've actually, I found some of that chat and, you know, we're all uh like millennial minus in terms of our ages um finding that to be a really useful collaborative tool um especially because you know man is in new york until very recently scarlet was in la and i'm in ashland oregon so you know chat ended up being actually a great way for us to sort of get our heads together 
um, in the time being. But I'm looking forward to having like drinks with them. That's all three of us have not been in the same space since uh, this experiment has started. So that's going to happen this weekend, which we're really excited about. <laughs> uh, I can't remember how tall Mayan is. It's been a few years, so you know. Yeah, we have a um, we, we have a calendar where basically because the five of us came in to an organization um, early on, there was a calendar set up that had all of the meetings that were occurring and there was an open door policy. So because there were no deliverables expected, it was more, you are invited to anything you choose to attend, but you are not expected in anything. Um, if you are there, your robust participation is welcomed or if you just wanna be a fly on the wall, which I think was very important to the style question of some people want to participate differently and, and honoring that. Um, so we d a meeting that I tend to attend pretty frequently is the producers meeting on Monday where we talk about season planning, um, different uh, projects that are coming up, different uh, things that Calchix is thinking of for either the current season or the up current season. Dreaming planning often comes up at the end of these meetings. Uh, and then there have been one-offs for special projects, which I've attended or other members of the artist circle has attended. There's also an open invitation to bring projects or interests to the table. Um, so there's at any point we can email Leanne or Eric and say, hey, I'd like to have a meeting about X, Y, and Z. I was working on a writing project. So I had an initial meeting with them about how CalShakes could support that or what resources they could offer. And other members of the cohort can be invited to that. So what I find it is, it's interesting to hear you talk everyone about how about inconsistency because I think that also because everyone's busy and especially because we're individual artists who are not on staff there's the the beautiful part of it of that there's an influx of perspective that is not because we're not on payroll it, we don't feel beholden to agree with anyone and I mean that in a positive way um, but then there's also you know when we do shows people disappear for a month um, and so there it's hard to find that consistency but um, but it's been really nice to be able to have an an organizational experience where it feels like there's constant movement through like there's something about um the cycling of artists in a meeting you never are quite certain who's going to be in the room and there's some and the positive side of that is it feels rejuvenating um to and, and everyone's very excited when you know as someone who's been gone for a show is finally able to come back and, and bring their wisdom from their experience and new perspective into the room um, so it's and then we do have a monthly cohort meeting um, where it's just us and um, uh, Leanne who is doing um, artistic programming and then Eric, um, the artistic director. And we, it tends to just be more of a cocktail hour than anything else because it's just about connection. And that's really, that's really nice because I, I do, like everyone has said, really miss the in-person just sharing about your life and not necessarily making a plan or trying to get something done. Um, thank you everyone for all those answers. We're going to move now to um, to asking questions of the audience and see if um, uh, open it up to our our viewers. And I know there might be some questions that are on Facebook that um, for those in our audience. Uh, you should now have the ability to unmute yourself if you would like to come on camera and ask your question. Please raise your virtual or physical hand, um, or please feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, and if you don't ask questions, Tanya and I have lots more. Tanya, do you want to ask your books question, which I love? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I just was wondering, um, I know you, you've all said that there aren't, aren't models necessarily for us to look at. So I was sort of curious, like if there's any books or organizations or uh, that you're looking to for some inspiration or maybe models outside of the United States that have, have served for some sort of inspiration.
Well, I will say that a book that was revolutionary in my thought about leadership, which is, I, I'm sure everyone is familiar with, so I'm um, probably dating myself a little bit, but um, Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown, it just sort of thinking about how to allow things to surface versus trying to control things. Um, I think it's really helpful in disrupting a colonial mindset around hierarchy and leadership. And then also another book that I really appreciated in terms of talking about the, I think the way that she frames it, it's a book called Freedom is a Constant Struggle by Angela Davis, Dr. Angela Davis. And she says something, um, I'm paraphrasing, but about the myth of the magnetic leader and that it all movements, you know, whether it's Dr. King or, or whomever, that we tend to look at it retrospectively as, um, as this one person who led the charge when it's really a system of many pockets of people working in concert to change something. Um, and whether it's civil rights or other movements, um, it's never just a single um, person. And I, I see that, I see how we have cultivated that specifically around artistic directors and in theatrical institutions of that, um, they're the figurehead for the audience and the figurehead for so many folks and it becomes, it can become a cult of personality versus really pulling that apart and allowing um, the, the many people who are part of the institution or organization to work together and, and to acknowledge that group work and to move the, the organization forward. And so that was really helpful for me, not only in crystallizing my critiques of what was happening that I felt but couldn't verbalize, and then also thinking about, well, if I don't want to be in a traditional position of power as people recognize per title, what, how does leadership work in, you know, my role or, or many different roles, you know, if, how does someone who works backstage, how is that leadership and how can it be valued? And so I really recommend those two books if people are looking for places to begin. Oh, the Wilma has an acting company called the, the Hot House. Uh, I think this is based on European models, some European theaters that have acting companies as part of the structure of the theater. Um, that was one of the things that really attracted me to the Wilma in the first place, because you have this group of actors who are training regularly and they really trust each other and know each other really deeply. And I think that can elevate the kind of work you're able to make, especially if you have a three week rehearsal process, like you have a three week rehearsal process and then you have years of history and work underneath that with the actors on stage. So it's kind of incredible. Um, something interesting that's happening is uh, this shared leadership model was introduced about three years ago, but it was, it is a shared leadership structure at the top, a non-hierarchical structure at the top. The way the organization is structured is still hierarchical. There's a department head, someone who works under them, maybe an intern. And so what's starting to change is now um, the hothouse, the acting company, has adopted a shared leadership structure. So there are three uh, interim leaders of the hothouse from within that group. So it, it's kind of interesting to see how this might trickle the non-hierarchical shared leadership thing. Um, and, and also where it just like doesn't want to trickle in, inside of the nonprofit structure. Um, but yeah, that, that was in a book recommendation, just a model looking at Europe, all of, all of Europe. <laughs> Yeah, this isn't a book, but I would say early on when we were um, forming and, and reforming, we, we looked to uh, the collective universes a lot, um, their sort of collaborative model and how they created and how they, in a lot of ways, like avoided becoming an institution and, and really sort of just worked as a sort of similar, I think, to what Morgan is saying. There's a shared history there. It's a sort of um, a, a model that that we really uh, looked at a lot uh, when, when we were starting it and, and Mildred and Stephen were, were mentors. Um, uh, and I would say, you know, 
in, in recent years, it's been a lot of like looking to um, sort of queer art collectives. You know, there's a there's a, a an art collective and a dance party poppy juice here in New York that I love. Um, and then I, I always want to just like, I'm like, there's something about that sort of community building, that idea that there is, uh, that it, it really is about the artists at the center, you know, um, and that all of the leaders are also artists there. Um, there's a, 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 a relatively younger organization called Legacy. It's a Black queer production company collective. Um, and, you know, I feel like I'm constantly also, you um, looking towards some of the the newer organizations that are coming up now that are are starting you know from who have had models of shared leadership that 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 maybe we didn't have and who are now revolutionizing it in new ways so i think for me it's like looking back towards like these new organizations and sort of being inspired by um how, how they're doing it um yeah Um, not to push forward a friend's book, but I will. Uh, Megan Sandberg Zakian, who's a co-founder with me of Maya Directors, um, has a book called There Must Be Happy Endings on a Theater of Optimism and Honesty. There you go. Um, who is, uh, uh, and it's a, uh, it's not about leadership specifically, but it's about process and when, theater is as hard as it is, the world is as hard as it is, how can you continue to center optimism and honesty in a way that doesn't feel fake or toxic? Um, uh, and it's it has really personal specific examples and it's really about, in my mind, about rehearsal room. Uh, but for me, what has been really, uh, what I found myself feeling very torn apart by is that I have a very specific way I'm able to hold space in the rehearsal room as a director and be collaborative and uh, really actively be a service leader. And the ways in which since taking this job at OSF, how the system doesn't allow for me to show up with the same sort of honesty, open heartedness and sweetness that I like to think I have in rehearsal rooms and how that does not currently, it's starting to work in my leadership position at OSF and how I can feel like those before us, um, the hardening of myself in the leadership position and how I have to daily sort of reject that idea that I will you know, scab over because of the wound and let that heal, but then I will enter the same room with open heartedness um, so that the, the modeling of the kind of space we want to have is actually in my person and I'm not sort of fighting myself, to be honest, to become the leader I want to be at the size of company I want to be help run or run one day. So um, I've gone back to Megan's book a few times along the way uh, to remind myself why the fuck we're doing this. Sorry for swearing. That's just who I am. Um, so that has been a really helpful sort of grounding and reminding for me. I have to say, um, I worked in Philadelphia, not at the Wilma quite often and talked to Blanca quite a few times and, uh, being from Eastern Europe, Middle East, um, the idea of that acting company was a huge part of why I came to OSF, although OSF acting company is a very different structure has been, and we'll see how it shifts, of course, over the years, um, but the idea of training together and that commitment to learning and growing, not just as like, oh, this actor has acted here for so many years and people love them and they wanna see them in everything, but actually this actor has been part of the growth of a group of actors together and a real commitment to learning and training. Uh, that's something that uh, from actors I know who've been in the hot house, the way that organization has centered that group and has supported that group um, has been incredibly inspiring and something that I've been thinking a lot about over the last year or so as we look at, you know, whatever the next draft of our acting company arrangement is going to be at OSF. And is it just going to be actors? I don't know. You know, so it's um, there's something about uh, that that feels really, really important to me. And emergent strategy, it's almost like a I feel like a joke saying that that's really helpful. As you said, Lauren, like 
if we all could actually function the way that book says we should, we would not have to have these conversations. Everything would be peace and love. Um, but here we are. So, you know, so, um, but that idea of, um, I guess, iterative progress, big experiments, bold experiments, and then commitment to those experiments functioning in an iterative way it, within structures that are really calcified. And when do you break those structures? When do you just slowly melt those structures? Those are sort of leadership questions that are like very active for me all the time. Um, so as we're rounding out our time together, um, I was on, I went to a panel that everyone was on. And at some point you said, uh, joy is a political act. And I wrote it on a post-it and it's like, sits on my cork board and I, um, uh, just because that idea is very important to me. And, and so I just wanted us to end on a last question about, I just, uh, what is something that really brings you joy at your organization? Something, it could be a moment or a specific aspect of it. I'd love to hear that. Um, so we do our, we, for the last like eight or nine years, we do, uh, a holiday card. Um, and the impetus for the holiday card came out of wanting to show our audience who is running the organization, that we were five brown producers and that we were running the organization. And so every year it's gotten bigger and bigger. Um, and we have like a team, sorry, someone is like doing something, so there might be noise. Um, but every year we have a team, there is like, hair and makeup people i my my partner styles it we like i creative direct it we have a photographer and we do this like sort of old school holiday card and it is a lot of work but it is one of the funnest days of the year for me because we get to come together look feel and just be fabulous <laughs> and like it's just such a beautiful bonding moment that we have and our new cards are coming out next week. So be on the lookout for those, but it's just a beautiful moment where I think we do get to center joy and ourselves and, and, you know, it's a moment of like self-appreciation for the hard work that we do that a lot of it does go unnoticed. Cause I don't think a lot of people are, are looking to like, what's the leader doing, you know, aside from the sort of figurehead. Um, so it's a really, I think that's the thing that brings me the most joy about the organization is that that time that we get to spend every year, one day, just being ridiculously fabulous. And I get to just play like dress up with five people. It's like playing with Barbie dolls, but like better. <laughs> Love that. Um, Philly is a foodie city and I've learned that some of my cohort are, they're really into food, like both cooking and going to restaurants. And so I think they're like, I think we will just go hard talking about food and that is really fun and brings me a lot of joy. <laughs> uh, people. I will say uh, we're on the verge of like having what feels like a complete um, artistic team that's been sort of put together by Nataki and all of us. And I mean, you know, pro transitions are hard. And um, we had like a wine and pizza moment in my house. We were all tested, everybody. We were all in the, you know, the pod. Um, and it wasn't all of us there, but there was just, um, you know, this house I've lived in for almost a year, which hasn't seen anyone but me and my husband and my dog. Um, all of a sudden there were like 10, 12 people here and there were conversations happening in the court. Like it was, it just felt alive with the energy of the artistic team and the production team. Um, and it was just like a really, uh, it was joyous. It sort of washed over me. And then just to name a name, Danya Washington, who's our festival producer and just like a true deep badass um, and just makes everything happen in our repertory in a certain way, while also continuing to uplift people, including me. Um, 
she brings me a lot of joy um, on a daily basis and I'm very thankful for her. I think we, I think we would, if everyone else was here from the artist circle and Caltech staff were um, very good at going off on tangents. Um, and my favorite parts of the conversation is during a meeting, there's often a moment where Eric will be like, well, if this was your, like, what would you do? And then everyone will just sort of go on this tangent of dreaming and will, you know, if, if I was the one who was making all the decisions, like this is how I would, I would do it. And, and it becomes a sort of collage of dreams. And I, I find that to be really invigorating because we all value each other's perspective so much. And there's a deep sense of generous, loving curiosity that is brought during those conversations that, that it doesn't matter what the result is, it really provokes a deep sense of thought that I think is exciting for all of us in terms of what we do within the organization and then also what we do on our own or with other organizations or companies that we work with. And that that is a consistent thing that happens at these meetings that I find deeply, deeply joyful because there's a, a sense of play to the conversation um, that we're able to maintain. And, and that's really important to me. I think a sense of play and joy are wonderful ways to end tonight's conversation. Um, we're at the end of our time. I want to thank all of our brilliant panelists, Morgan, David, Evren, Lauren, Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, for audience members, if you want to find out more about our fabulous panelists and their work, all of their links are on our event page. Um, I want to thank our panelists, our uh, partners to this event at HowlRound, our wonderful ASL interpreters, Steve and Valerie, and the entire Wingspace Salons Committee for this 2021 season. This is our final virtual salon for the year. Um, this is number 34 since we've started doing virtual salons. Um, and the ability to do that um, is due to all the hard work uh, on behalf of everyone at the Wingspace Salons team. We're going to say their names. Uh, Christine Mock, Edward Morris, who is here with us tonight, Kate Freer, who got us on Facebook, Adrian Jones, who made all the wonderful uh, uh, Instagram beautiful headshots of you, um, Rodrigo Hernandez, E.L. Hohn, Anna Driftmeyer, and Tanya, and myself. Um, again, this is our final salon of 2021, but when we have our upcoming salons for 2022, those can be found on our website at wingspace.com slash events. You can also join our email list there to get uh, notifications about these directly to your inbox. Um, and finally, as we look ahead to 2022, um, we're interested to hear from you about what topics you would like to discuss. Um, if tonight sparks something for you, let us know. Uh, you can email all of us at salons at wingspace.com. And on that note, we're going to stop streaming and recording. Um, Tanya and myself will stay on the Zoom for a couple of minutes just to say thank you uh, and good night, but you're welcome to unmute and say hello, turn on your camera if you would like. Thank you again so much everyone for joining us and have a good night. <laughs>